Good morning, family. It's a joy to see you all here this morning, and I know many of you are joining us online as the weather is not the nicest out right now, but it's wonderful to gather together and talk about what the Lord is doing and to dive into His Word. We've talked a lot about um, the book of Acts and how God moves in people's lives, and, and one of those themes is God moves in their lives through baptism. We've seen them in the book of Acts, story after story, um, people being baptized in the early church in the early days of the Christian movement. And so today we're going to be focusing on the biblical view of baptism. We're in the middle of our Acts sermon series, and today the Apostle Paul shares a little bit of his baptism testimony, and this will plunge us into the discussion of baptism. It's a large discussion. Even last week I had the honor of being with a couple, and I sat with them for four hours talking about baptism and looking at scriptures and processing things. So I'm going to try to take those four hours and condense them down to 35 minutes or so. So obviously there's going to be some things we, we can't cover or don't cover this morning, um, but we will be having connect group afterwards in the fellowship hall to continue the discussion on baptism with questions, concerns, feedback, um, even hearing some of your testimonies and, and uh, just celebrating what God has done in our lives. Because God is in the business of redeeming broken people and making them whole. We're going to see today as we study baptism, we're going to read our Acts passage and make a couple comments as we read through the passage, but then we'll dive into baptism. And, and part of the reason that we're talking about baptism is because if you receive the leadership notes in our weekly email on Friday, um, you'll know that as a leadership team, we, have been, we discussed baptism for about two and a half to three months um, those leadership t notes describe some of what God was showing us, and we were processing together as a team. We prayed together over the scriptures. We processed and read the scriptures together. We looked at Anabaptist history. We looked at biblical proofs. We looked at church practices now and reflected on how it is practiced before. Quite frankly, we looked at a lot of things concerning baptism, and eventually we came to a place where we could be unified and as a leadership team, we want to be transparent with you. We want to communicate with you what the Lord is revealing to us in part through our bi-monthly meetings. And um, part of that is communicating what we spent two to half to three months looking at, which is baptism. Many of you grew up in the Mennonite tradition, which is Anabaptism and its roots. Many of you grew up in this very church. But many of us actually came from different faith backgrounds. And so we understand that today may be challenging for some of us. You may leave today with more questions than you have answers, simply because what we talk about and we see in the Bible may have contradicted what you kind of grew up with or what you were maybe taught in, in the different areas of Christian, Christian religion. I believe one of the greatest works of the devil is that he has distorted the biblical view of baptism, and the devil has turned baptism into something it's not, and so a lot of times many of us may have receive teachings or understanding of, of something that the devil has twisted because the devil knows how powerful God wants to redeem people and how baptism can be part of that. We, I pray that today we would be in a place of unity as we leave and as we discuss things in the Connect group afterwards. But if you leave today with questions, don't be discouraged. Press in, dive into the scriptures that you see today. In the leadership notes, we gave you a long list of some of the scriptures we were processing. I have a document, I think it's like 12 pages long, on, there's, there's 30 plus do, uh, verses in the Bible in the New Testament alone about baptism. So if you have questions, if you have things, hey, I want to learn a little bit more about this, let me know. I can print that off for you and I can give it to you or I could send that document to you via email. Our hope today is that each and every one of us would come into a deeper understanding of God's purpose, of his plan, of his love for us as we look at baptism specifically. The heart behind this message is that each and every one of us would come to understand how wonderful God is, how redemptive, powerfully, and marvelously he works in our lives, and how he takes us from broken sinners and makes us redeemed saints by the Spirit of God. So if you bear with me today, our lives together may be changed. Let's begin with our passage. If you have your Bibles, please open to Acts chapter 21. We're going to finish Acts chapter 21 with one verse. It's verse 40. And then we'll move into Acts chapter 22 and read the first part of that. Before I read, I want to remind you that Paul is on his way to jail. He has been beaten by a mob of angry Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem. 
He is surrounded now by the Roman guards who are taking him to jail, but they're also protecting him from being killed. And in the midst of this chaos, Paul asks the Roman officer, hey, can I talk to the people real quick? And the officer allows him to do so. And that's where we're picking up in Acts 21, um, verse 40. It reads, After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood up on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, or Hebrew, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speaking to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Sicily and brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a leading teacher of the Jewish law and customs at that time. He would be like one of our famous teachers or preachers of today. And he, Paul studied underneath this guy called Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. It was, I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of the way. The way is simply referring to Christians. Before they were, we were called Christians, we were called people of the way. To their death, I arrested both men and women, throwing them into prison. As the high priest and all the council can te themselves testify, I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus. And I went there to bring to the people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. And so now the next verse is Paul's going to recount part of his conversion story on the road to Damascus. We see his conversion story in the book of Acts. And we pick up here on his story in verse 6. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul. Before Saul became Paul, Paul was Saul. And so that's why it's Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There will you, be, you will be told all you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by hand into Damascus because of the brilliant light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Paul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. And then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear the words of his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. Now, in the midst of this conversion story, Paul has just been healed of his blindness, right? He is believing in Jesus. He met Jesus on the road, and, and Ananias has come to him, and Ananias is going to tell him to do something in verse 16. And now, what are you waiting for, Ananias asks Saul. Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on the name Ananias tells Paul to be baptized, and we know that in Acts chapter 9 that Paul did indeed go and get baptized, even before he was eat. He was fasting for three days. Before he ate, he went and got baptized, and then he came back and had a meal. So we know it, it happened. It doesn't say it happened here, but we know in Acts 9 it, he did go and be baptized. Verse 17, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately. Because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. This is the word of the Lord. And this ends Paul's dialogue to the crowd, because next week we'll see, right after he says that, the crowd gets wild again and won't even listen to him. But there are a few important points in this passage that we could have highlighted and spent time on, but one that stood out above the rest, and the reason why we're talking about baptism today is because Paul described his baptism. After Paul, who was Saul at the time, was healed, verse 16, Ananias asked Paul a question. What are you waiting for? It seems a rhetorical question, one where Ananias is applying, hey, dude, God just healed you. You spoke to Jesus on the road to Damascus. You believe. What are you waiting for next? Keep following him. You see, Paul has faith. He's open to following Jesus now in a new way of life. And this leads Paul to the next step in his journey with Jesus, his conversion story, and that is baptism. 
So verse 16 says, Ananias tells Paul to get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Ananias is telling Paul to be baptized, and it's an intricate part of Paul's journey. Now, what exactly, though, is Ananias telling Paul about baptism? Is Ananias literally telling Paul that he is to be baptized, and as he is being baptized, his sins will be washed away? Or is Ananias just a poet and saying to Paul, go and be baptized, and it will represent or be a picture or a symbol of your sins being washed away as you call on Jesus' name? The answer to that question, whether Ananias is saying a literal washing away or a figurative symbolic washing away, depends on your Biblical view of baptism, how we see the scriptures connect together, maybe where how you were brought up in, in your church um, denomination. And this leads us, though, to a quick church history lesson. I do not want to spend too much time talking about church history or the different denominations because I believe there could be one. There could be one church, one denomination, if people would all, if we'd all put ourselves underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ. If we get rid of our personal preferences, die to ourselves, and put ourselves underneath that lordship of Jesus, we could all be one church, unified together. Amen. Unfortunately, there is a division in God's church, and so we do have to spend a little bit of time dissecting the different denominations. This church history lesson takes us back to 1054 AD. Up until this time, there had been one church, the Catholic Church. And then in 1054 AD, the Catholic Church splits into two groups— It's called the Great Schism. Fast forward a couple hundred years to 1517, you have the Catholic Church, still the main religious group in the world, but it experiences a reformation. In 1517, some Catholic priests step away from the Catholic Church and said enough is enough. There were some practices in the Catholic Church that were not um, very, very not lining up with the biblical principles, and so some people called Reformers, who are called Reformers now, stepped away and said, we need a change. 1517 marks what we would call the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation kicked into gear, people exploring Christianity and the Bible for the first time ever. Before it was all Catholic Church telling you what to believe. For the first time ever, people are getting their own Bibles because of the printing press, and they're starting to read for themselves. So this Reformation leads to 1525, when a group of Reformed Christians gather in an upper room in Switzerland, and they read the Bible. It was a small group of Christians, working class Christians, not clergy, and these normal Christian people start simply reading the Bible for what it says, and as they read the Bible, they come across passages about baptism. Up until this point in 1525, infant baptism was the normative and really the only way they were doing baptism at that time in all the churches. There's a long history of how infant baptism became normative that we're not going to go into today. But these Reformed Christians in 1525 read the Bible and says, infant baptism is not God's way. And so in an upper room in Switzerland, outside of any religious institution, these Reformed Christians baptized each other and dedicated themselves to living into obedience to the Scriptures above all else. Above the Pope, above state religion, above government, these Christians devoted themselves to the Lordship of Jesus. Fast forward a year or two, and these Reformed Christians come to be called Anabaptism, or Anabaptists. So in 1525, our Anabaptist movement started. They're called Anabaptists because that means to baptize again. Baptism again, because if you were baptized as an infant, these Anabaptist Christians would say, no, you need to be baptized by your faith when you believe in Jesus and you repent of your sins. And as an infant, we don't have that faith. You don't have your own faith yet. And Anabaptism is the foundation of our Mennonite church here, of Brethren in Christ, of Church of the Brethren, of the Amish even. Because they were telling the religious institutes at that time, the Catholic Church and the Reformed Church, that people need to be baptized on the profession of their faith as a grown adults, not as infants, Anabaptists were martyred. They were killed. The early Anabaptists were killed for their belief in baptism. You see, Anabaptists did not fit the mold of the Catholic Church or the Reformed Church. They were somewhere in between. If you study church history, church historians call Anabaptism the third way. And because they did not, Anabaptists did not fit into the Reformed mold or the Catholic mold, both groups of Christians killed the Anabaptists. Martin Luther, a leading reformer at the time, is quoted to have said, the only thing Anabaptists are good for are for martyrdom or to be killed. Hundreds of Anabaptists were killed simply because of what they believed in baptism. No other reason, folks, except for that. 
So the question arises in my mind as I learn about Anabaptism, as I study it, what did an Anabaptist believe about baptism that was so radical they were being killed for it, but so radical they were willing to die for it? And how does their faith, how does that faith and what they believed affect our history and our lives today? God moves in a person's life through baptism is, the num- is one of the number one things they believed as Anabaptists. They had two foundations. One, God moves in a person's life through baptism. And two, baptism is a necessary step of faith of a Christian to take. These two foundations are the leading causes of what got them killed. We look at the past to make sure we are not staying off of God's path in the, f- in the future now. That's why we looked a little bit at church history. We want to make sure, hey, we're not just making up something. We want to see where our Anabaptist um, forefathers came from. But we want to go even back further than church history. We want to go back to Jesus' history, to the Bible's history. The Anabaptists came up with their view of baptism based simply on reading the Bible and being led by the Spirit. So let's open our Bibles. Let's read our Bibles and see what the Bible says about baptism and let, us, let the Spirit lead us. The world offers us a lot of insights into baptism. We have 2,000 years You guys realize we're farther away from Jesus than Abraham was, right? So there's been 2,000 years of the devil working to trying to destroy the church. There's been 2,000 years of, as the epistles talk about, a lot of false teachers coming into the church. And so we want to just look and see, what does the Bible say? How can we let the Spirit teach us? Because that was what Anabaptism was all about. They didn't know anything. They They just read the Bible and said, this is what it says, and this is what the Spirit's teaching us. So let us do the same. Let's start with Jesus. What did he say about baptism? Maybe if you have an Ashish, another battery, the clicker doesn't seem to be working. The battery's a little low. I have a lot of slides today because there's a lot of text, so maybe, yeah. Matthew 3, 14, Jesus was baptized. So he gives us the example of baptism, right? Like, hey, if we want to be like Jesus, we should probably be baptized because Jesus was baptized. John 3, 22 and John 4, 2, Jesus' disciples are in the early part of the ministry described, hey, they're going out baptizing people. That was part of their ministry. The Gospel of John, you know, the story of Nicodemus, when Jesus sits with the Pharisees, Jesus says, you need to be born again. You must be born of the water and of the Spirit. At the end of Jesus' time on earth, he gives us a command to go and make disciples. Slide, or Matthew 28, 16 through 20 is what we would call one of the great commissions. And it says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Okay, that's the command. Go and make disciples of all the nations. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. There are two actions in this passage, in this command, how to make disciples. One, how to make disciples and how to be disciples. One, baptize And then two, teach them everything Jesus has commanded. Jesus had a pretty big emphasis on baptism. And baptism is part of making disciples of Jesus. If if you've been with us through the book of Acts, you've probably realized and noticed that baptism was emphasized. Thanks, bro. Conversion story after conversion story after conversion story in the early church. The disciples of Jesus baptized people. Look at one passage in Acts In the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, Peter has just finished preaching the first sermon about Jesus. People are like, okay, we hear your sermon. Let us respond to what you're saying. What do we need to do, they asked. They literally asked, what shall we do? And Peter replied to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In this passage, Paul is saying, go and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins. In our passage today, in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Paul is baptized. Why? For the washing away of his sins. Again, are these just symbolic ideas of being baptized for the washing and the forgiveness of sins? Or does the Bible literally mean this? Does the Bible say that when we are baptized is when our sins are being washed away in this, pro- in this journey with Jesus? This is the challenge we're wrestling with. That's the challenge the Anabaptists wrestle with. The real tension in baptism theology is at the foundation, does God do something? Is God moving in that moment of baptism or is, it, is, is baptism simply you doing an action to symbolize what God has already done in you when you believed? 
What is baptism? Is it a symbol of what God has already done, or is it more? You see, in the American church, in the Reformed Protestant view, many times baptism is simply an outward symbol of an inward change. Um, Probably all of us have heard that before, that phrase, baptism is an outward symbol of an inward change. But what is implied is that that change has already happened when you believed. By calling baptism a symbol, it's implied that baptism is representing something God has already done. The Reformed Protestant churches at that time and and still in, in the American church sometimes deny that God does anything in the actual moment of your baptism, that God's not there with you. God's not moving in your life. It's, it's just you being obedient and representing what God has already done. The sad thing is that time after time after time, the Bible says God does something in the life of the person who has faith as in the act of, in the moment of their baptism. And that's what the Anabaptists wrestle with. In Anabaptist theology, and according to the Bible, God does something in the moment of baptism. You may ask, do we see this in the Scriptures? That's the question we should always ask. Any sermon we hear, anything we're hearing from a friend, like, is that in the Bible? Better make sure that's in the Bible first. Well, thank you for asking that question. Because starting with these two verses in the book of Acts 2 and Acts 22, it does seem that God is doing something of a, of a washing, of a forgiveness of sins in the moment of our baptism. Now, we don't have time to go into how the blood of Christ in the moment of our baptism works as well and how the Spirit's moving into us. Those are part of that four hours of conversation we could have. We're kind of talking more about just this, our obedience of baptism today. But let's keep looking at some other passages How many of you have heard, raise your hand if you've heard that you've been clothed with Christ Jesus, right? You've heard that. I've been clothed with Christ Jesus. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? A beautiful promise. It's a beautiful reality. It's wonderful. A question that arises is when? When were you clothed with Christ Jesus? You see, there is one place in the New Testament that talks about you and me being clothed with Jesus, and it's in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, which says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Notice that it says all of you who were baptized, not those who repented, not those who put their faith in Jesus, not those who prayed a prayer of salvation. No, it says all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have thus clothed yourself with Christ. This verse simply reveals to us that God does something in baptism. That in baptism, something is happening to us, and in this case, we're being clothed with Christ. We could also logically conclude that if we have not been baptized into Christ Jesus, we have not been clothed with Christ. There is a transactional movement that is happening when we put our faith in Him and take the step of obedience to be baptized. Faith is what's essential, folks. That's why Anna Batch was like, you can't have an infant baptism because there's no faith. We have to have the faith. It's the faith. It has nothing to do with the water itself, but the faith that a, a believer is bringing to that moment. It's not about the baptism or the water alone. It's about the faith that we have in Jesus when we are baptized. It's this balance of faith and action put together. Look at verse 26, right before this verse 27. It says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through what? Through faith. And there is an element that has to be faith. But then it says, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. This is exactly why. There was actually a movement in church history where Christians were gathering up people by force, literally bringing them to the water and shoving them in the water and bringing them up and saying, hey, you've been baptized. (laughs) You're, You're good to go with Jesus. But there was no faith. You know, we have to have the balance, this balance between faith and action, obedience. It's actually echoed in James chapter 2, verse 17, which says, In the same way, faith also, if it has no works or obedience, is dead, being by itself. Later in that passage, I think it's verse 22, it's that term faith alone that we hear quite often is in this passage and it says we are not justified by faith alone, but by works and faith together. We need faith and action, faith and obedience Yes, faith is important. We cannot be saved without it. We cannot even be in a relationship with Jesus without faith. But again, in this same passage in James chapter 2, it says even the demons have faith. Even the demons believe. 
So there's this, an, a step of obedience that God is calling everyone to. We are responding to Jesus in faith by being baptized. And as we're being baptized, the Anabaptists believe God was doing something. From the Acts chapter 2 and chapter 22 passages, they literally believed. The early Anabaptists literally believed. You can look at 9, uh, 1527 Confession of Faith that the Anabaptists put out. They literally believed they, as they were being, with their faith and obedience, their sins were being washed away and forgiven. From the Galatians 3 passage, they believed they were actually clothed with Christ as they were being baptized. Let's continue. Look at Romans 6. The whole chapter is about um, baptism. So if you want to read Romans 6, the whole chapter is about it, about becoming a slave to righteousness or a slave to sin. But verse 3 through 7 give us a pretty good glimpse. So verse 3, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized, who were what? Yes, baptized, not believed or repented, but baptized. All of, us who were, all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. The early Anabaptists believed that their sinful nature, their old self, was literally dying with Christ when they were baptized. Literally, not figuratively. Why? Because this passage says you were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him. How? Through baptism. Baptism is a burial of the old body, the old self, with Jesus. Buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism was part of this new life, the Anabaptists believe. Verse 5, For if we have been united with him in the death like his, through baptism, we will also be united with him in a resurrection like his, in a death like his. Jesus went into a grave and died for three days, and then he rose again. In our baptism, we maybe are poured on or sprinkled, but if we're submerged, we're in the water for about three seconds, and then we rise like him. Verse 6, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin, the sin nature, might be done away with, and we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Anyone who has died, a baptism is a burial. Anyone who has died has been set free from sin. That is a glorious reality. How do Christians die with Christ? This passage seems to say when we are baptized. So when we are baptized, when we were set free from sin, if you ever hear a preacher or a Christian tell you you will always be a slave to sin, that's blasphemy. Right here in this passage, it says you have been set free from sin. At least that's what the early Anabaptists believe, and that's what this passage seemed to say, and that's actually what I experienced in my own life. I had faith and repentance in the back of a cop car at age 17. I, my life was changed. I encountered God, right? At 18, living in India, I received the Holy Spirit. But I was still struggling with anger and lust. There was still something inside of me that kept bringing me back to pornography, kept making me frustrated when I shouldn't have been frustrated. And I read passages like this, and it says, you're free, Chad. And I said, I don't feel free. So about 10 years into my journey with Jesus, God said, you need to be baptized. And I said, I've already been baptized because I grew up as a Lutheran. So my parents baptized me. And I said, Lord, I don't need to be baptized. You must be wrong. I've already been baptized. So for the next year and a half to two years, God kept saying, no, you need to be baptized, Chad. No, you need to be baptized, Chad. No, you need to be baptized. And eventually, through some other believers and brothers in Christ, I, God revealed to me, yes, I do need to be baptized on my faith, on my profession of my confession that Jesus is Lord. And so one day they brought me down to a river and they baptized me in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I died with Christ and I rose with Christ. And everyone's baptism experience is different. But I had been struggling for 12 years with the weight of sin and that chains of wanting to be free. So when they brought me out of the water, I looked at the guy next to me and I said, keep throwing me because I feel so light. That's what it felt like. I had experienced the freedom that I'd been wanting for 12 years. And I'm like, why don't I feel free, Jesus? And Jesus is like, because you haven't been baptized. You need to walk in obedience. It's not about the baptism itself. It's about the faith of walking into that reality. And three days later, it's one o'clock in the morning or so, we come back from a wedding. Tiff and I come back from a wedding. It's tired. I had just cleaned the whole living room of our house. And I had a big thing of Chex Mix because I got that from the wedding. I was going to eat it in the morning. And I was taking my winter jacket off and I hit the, the thing of Chex Mix all over our clean floor. And... 
I looked at the Chex Mix, I looked at the cup, and I said, oh, I'll clean it up in the morning, and I walked to my bedroom. Tiff came in, a couple minutes later, she's like, who are you? And, and I said, what do you mean, hon? She's like, for the last 12 years of our, 10 years, or eight years, I guess we were at the um, eight years of marriage, I, I was waiting for you to blow up. Because normally I would. Like, I was frustrated. I was tired. I was frustrated. I just made a mess of what I just cleaned up. I would have probably gone and stomped on the cup, said this, this, this stinking cup, oh, get angry at it. I didn't. Because I was set free by Jesus from my anger, from that sin. Galatians 5, fits of rage is an act of the flesh. If our flesh is being buried with Jesus, it's no longer in control. And so I walked to the room, and, and I looked at Tiff, and I said, babe, that was who I was. It's not who I am in Jesus Christ. Set free from that right? And that's what the Anabaptists were experiencing. That's what I have experienced. That's what the scriptures seem to be saying here. This theology of the Anabaptist boiled down to a couple things. They were untrained working people who simply read the Bible. They had childlike faith to believe what the Bible says must be true, and the Holy Spirit confirmed them in powerful ways. And they believed it so much that they were willing to die for the belief that God does something in baptism. It's not just a symbol. Anabaptism, Anabaptists call baptism a sign, not a sacrament or a symbol, but a sign. And this theology actually still carries into us today, that baptism is a sign. The 1995 Confession of Faith from the Anabaptists or from the Mennonite, if you look on our LMC website, calls um, baptism a sign, a sign is defined as an act of God. So God is acting. Baptism is an act of God upon a person's life. Some examples in that confession of faith that they give are Moses in the Red Sea. God does everything, right? God parts the waters. God holds the water up. God makes the dry land. God does it all, but God says, Moses, I need you to take your staff and put it on the edge of the water. And then I will part the Red Sea, right? So God was waiting for Moses to respond in faith, believing that there's an ocean here. I've never seen an ocean or a sea. I've never seen a sea part. But God said it's going to happen. So I'm going to believe in God. So in faith, Moses acts, comes and puts his staff on the edge of the Red Sea. And what does God do? God parts it, and Israel is set free. In the New Testament, it's actually called the baptism of Israel. They walk through the, bap the water, and they call it the baptism of Israel. The whole nation was baptized. Another example they use is Israel entering the promised land. Forty years of wandering, Israel's about to enter the promised land with Joshua, and God says, Joshua, I'm going to stop the river, but I need the priests to carry the tabernacle into the water, into the edge of the river, and then I'll stop the Jordan River, right? And so the priest and Joshua had faith. They had obedience. They took the staff, or they took the ark. They, as soon as they stepped on the edge of the river, God did all the work. God did everything. God always does everything but he was responding to faith and obedience. And so, in the same way, baptism is a sign or an act of God in a believer's life. God is the one who washes sins away. God is the one who forgives sins. God is the one who clothes us with Christ Jesus. God is the one who buries us in our sinful nature, our self, our old self. God is the one who raises us to new life, but God is waiting for us to respond in faith and obedience to his simple command, of be my disciple and be baptized. And when we have faith, when we obey and are baptized, God does everything. It's this balance of faith and works, of obedience and the sovereign hand of God. All of this, folks, is what the leadership team was processing together. We just had this list of scriptures, the Anabaptist history, and we're like, Lord, what is your heart? And you saw some of that in the leadership notes that were sent out Friday. A couple conclusions were in that leadership notes. The first one is that we agree with our Anabaptist forefathers and we, as a leadership team, would say baptism is a sign. It's not just a symbol. That's the overarching unity that we had as a leadership team is that God truly does work in a person's life in the moment of baptism. Just like he does when we first believe, God works in your life when you have faith. God works in your life when you repent. God works in your life when you're baptized and you receive the Holy Spirit as you're moving through your journey with Jesus and being sanctified. God is always working. Now, as you saw in the leadership notes, we have two essentials, two areas that we were rarely strong on and would maybe emphasize, and two non-essentials. 
stemming from this theology that baptism is a sign or an act of God and not just a symbol representing something that has already happened, the first essential leadership team came up with that we wanted to communicate with you and encourage all of you to pray about and to discern is God does something in us through baptism. We believe God is moving in our lives through baptism. As he moved in our lives when we believed and repented, baptism is not just a symbol of what God has already done, but a sign of what God is actively doing in that moment of faith and obedience of our baptism. Now with that essential of God does something in us through baptism, we also agree to a non-essential, which is a non-essential clarifying exactly what God does through baptism. There are mysteries of God that we cannot define. We simply experience them. The exact way God moves in our lives in baptism is unique for everyone, and thus it's not essential to define exactly how God is moving, only that we understand he is moving in your life or our lives through baptism. So when you were baptized, you may have experienced something wonderful and amazing. It may have been super powerful. For others, it was nothing more than an embarrassing moment where your head got wet and your covering maybe fell off. No matter what your experience was, though, we must understand that God did something in you because it wasn't about your experience, it was about your faith. Did you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior when you were baptized? Amen. If you can say amen, yes, I did, then the realities of what God, whatever God does in you and moves in you became a reality. Because God's not limited by our understanding or our knowledge. He says, I just want your faith. I just want your obedience. We see in those passages that we read in Acts 2 and Acts 22 and Galatians 3, Romans 6, there's one in Colossians 2, there's one in Titus 3, 5, that give us descriptions a little bit about how God maybe is moving through our faith and we can live into those realities. Because when the devil whispers to me and says, Chad, you're still a slave to lust, I say, no, I'm not because Jesus has set me free because Romans 6 says so, right? We can live into the realities of who God has made us. And part of that journey with Jesus is baptism. As we journey with Jesus together in community, we want to be on the same path, the same path going towards Jesus, that path of seeking his face, of learning to live and love like him, the path of understanding of what God maybe is doing in baptism. But while we're on that path, we understand we may be on different sides of the path, right? Some of us may want to define exactly what God is doing in baptism. And some over here be like, hey, I believe God moves in baptism, but I don't need to define exactly what's going on. It's about the faith. That's okay, but we want to be on a journey together on that same path to clarify things and, and recognize what God is doing. Moving into our final point this morning, one area of tension that always arises with baptism is this question. Do we need to be baptized to be saved? Is baptism part of salvation journey? I don't know where many of you stand on this, but within the next seven minutes or so as we talk about it, I hope we each have a clear understanding of why we believe what we believe or don't believe. So to answer that question, does baptism save us? We need to look at what the living word of God tells us. Let's start with Jesus. Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. If you have a problem with the Mark 16 passage, just look at 1 Peter 3.21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal from the dirt of the body, because it's not about the water or the action. It's not a removal of the dirt from the body, but it's an appeal to God for a clean conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now here... Here is where we need to define and correct our understanding of this word saved, okay? For many of us, when we hear the word saved, we most likely hear of a context of heaven, right? If you ask someone, have you been saved? You're probably asking them, hey, are you going to go to heaven when you die, right? Is that, is that fair to assume that many of us think that? That if I'm saved, if we're talking about saved, you say I'm, going, I'm saved from hell and going to heaven, right? And so if we think of this word saved in context of eternal life, of escaping hell and going to paradise, we would think that baptism gets us a free ticket to heaven. But that's not true. 
You see, the, that's what, that, what that, that is what people have believed over the years. That's why they gathered up, that, those group of Christians gathered up people and were literally putting them in the water. It's like, hey, we're just going to get you into heaven because we believe it literally saves you without faith. That's not what the Greek word is saying, folks. We have to understand. If you, if you could read and speak Greek, this wouldn't really be a problem. But we don't read and speak Greek, and we have a lot of American evangelists and altar calls and sinner's prayer and things like that that maybe when we think of saved, we're thinking of heaven, only heaven. But the Greek word saved is the Greek word sozo. Sozo is, whenever you read about being saved, sozo is the Greek word. And sozo means to rescue, to make well, or to make whole. It's different than eternal life, guys. It is different than eternal life. Sozo is not talking about eternity. It's talking about restoration, to make something well or to make something whole, to heal something. There is a different word for eternal life, family. Remember John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that ever who would believe in him will not perish but be saved? No, but have eternal life. Eternal. Life. Eternal means eternity, long-lasting, forever and ever. In Jesus Christ, we have eternal, longing-lasting, forever and ever-ending life. When we think about heaven and hell, we need to think of it in terms of that eternal life. Jesus offers us eternal life, and that's about getting to heaven and hell. But there is a difference than being saved. The Greek word sozo is not talking about then and there, I'm going to be in heaven it's talking about here and now. Jesus Christ says the kingdom of God is where? Here. So if he brought the kingdom of God here now, he needs to change us and transform us so we can live in that kingdom of God now. He can, right now, we need to be saved now so we can live as saints, as Christians, as children of God on earth while we're still alive. So when we think of being saved, let's not think about eternal life in heaven. Let's think about the Greek word would make us think. Let's think about as the Bible talks about it. When we think about being saved, we should think about being made whole, being healed now. A great example of this is Matthew chapter 9, the story of the woman who is bleeding for uh, 12 years. Okay, So the passage reads, Just then a woman who has been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be saved. I will be healed. I will be sozo. Jesus turned to her and saw her and take, her, her, take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has healed you. It's the Greek word sozo. And the woman was sozo. She was healed. She was restored. She was made whole from a broken, bleeding woman of 12 years to a healed, restored, healthy person. She was saved. She was sozo. Do you see the Greek word for saved is not about eternal life. That's something else. The Greek word sozo means to be made whole, to be well, to be restored, to be healed. Another passage that comes to mind, I don't have a slide for it. There's a passage that says women shall be saved sozo through childbearing. Have you heard that passage? So if we think of sozo, saved, as being eternal life, that's saying when a woman gives birth to a child, she gets to go to heaven. No. Saved, sozo, to be made whole. There is a part of God made only women can give birth to children. So there's a part of women and purpose of when you give birth to child, you're being made whole. You're living into your purpose, your calling. Obviously, God has specific calling if God doesn't give you children or maybe you adopt or things like that. But there's a part of it. Do you see, if we think of sozo as saved, we would have to say, well, then if a woman gives child, she's going to heaven. That's, what the, that's how we would view the word sozo. But if we look at sozo as being made whole, of being healed, of being put back together, it, it, it's a little different. And the picture of this is a broken jar of clay. I think I got a picture here. You were created to be a pot you were created to be a tool, a, a vessel, a vessel, that's the word, a vessel of God. Sin came. You had a destiny. You had a purpose, guys, from God because he loves you and he cares for you. But sin came in and broke you. Sin came in and twisted your identity, twisted, twisted your mind, twisted all these things. And so we were a broken vessel. But Jesus, Jesus says, I did not come to the world to judge the world. I came to the world to save it, to sozo, to make it whole, to put it back together. And so part of our journey with Jesus, when we believe part of those broken pieces, when we have faith, those broken pieces get put back together 
in the pot, okay? Then as we repent, more of these pieces get put back together. When we receive the Holy Spirit, these pieces are getting put back together. God is making us whole. So you can live into your purpose, your destiny that God truly created you for. That sin and the separation that sin brings from God ruins your destiny and your purpose. But Jesus came to redeem you, to restore you to who you should have been before sin broke you. Before the world hurt you. And so as we're walking with Jesus, as we have faith, as we have repentance, as we have the Holy Spirit, we're being put back together by God. Not by our actions or our works, but by God. So when the Bible says baptism now saves you or makes you whole or restores you and heals you, it's just saying part of this journey with Jesus is Jesus is asking you to be obedient and he wants to restore you and bring you back to wholeness of who you were supposed to be so that that you can be a pot that can be filled up by the Lord and used for the glory of the Lord. The problem is so many Christians especially if in some of the denominations such as myself with Lutheran where they weren't where they were baptized as an infant and they weren't it wasn't their own faith they're living they're trying to live their christian journey but they're not completely put back together yet so they're trying to pour out to people and the water of the holy spirit's flowing out but it's kind of leaking out too of all these broken cracks and broken pieces another vision god can give us of of this journey with jesus is before jesus you're on this desert island. You're on the side of the desert, and there's a river running through that desert. And on the other side of the river is a, is a beautiful green plain, a beautiful, uh, beautiful area, a beautiful meadow. And God says, God's on the other side of the meadow calling you over saying, come join me. <laughs> come be with me in this wonderful, wonderful place of abundant life. And there's four steps, four, not equations, but four things that God calls us to in, in, in the Bible. And he says, believe in me. So when you believe, you step off from that, or you have faith, you step off from that desert and you step onto the stone. You're in the river of God, guys. It feels good. It feels great. You're living with Jesus. You're walking with Jesus and you repent. So you take another stone. So you're deeper. You're farther away from the desert. You're closer to paradise. You're in the river of God. You're receiving his blessings. It feels good. You receive the Holy Spirit. You take another step. You're closer and still. But the Bible says we need to be baptized. And so many Christians are standing in the river of God <laughs> Not fully whole yet, not fully put together. Like you, it feels good, but you could have actually have more abundant life if you would take the step of obedience and just obey your Lord and walk in faith and be baptized. That's what sozo means. And so as we think about that abundant life with Jesus, of everyone living into purpose and, and plans and passions for the Lord, the leadership team was processing that, and we came with our second essential. That baptism is a vital part of an abundant life with Jesus. It really is, guys. Like, that's what the Bible says. What, however, again, what other side of the path we're on, if we want to define what Jesus does in it, or if we just want to believe, hey, God, God moves in baptism. Baptism is a vital part of this abundant life with Jesus. There's one pastor who counsel, a very big counseling ministry. He says when a couple and people come to talk to him and they're struggling with certain sins, the first question he asks is, have you been baptized? And 90% of the time they haven't. So they're still struggling with this sin inside of them, that this, this, these chains that have weighed them down. They're not living in the abundant life with Jesus simply because they haven't been obedient to obey Jesus when he says, go and be baptized. Jesus commands us to be baptized, and so we believe it's a vital part of surrendered, abundant, and wonderful life with Jesus. Without baptism, we are missing part of the wholeness God brings to us in Christ Jesus, and the abundance of our life in him is hindered. Now, a non-essential, the details of how and when we baptize people. The exact way someone is baptized, sprinkling, pouring, submersion, is not essential to God moving in a person's life through baptism. The timing of when someone is baptized does not affect the grace God brings in a person's life when they take the step of faith and be baptized. The details of the how and when are not essential in the light of who we are joining and we are joining G- Lord Jesus. And so that's, that's the essentials and non-essentials of what the Lord is kind of showing us. We don't have time, that's why we're going to have a connect group, but we can talk more about the specifics of the hows and the whens and what it was like for you, whether you experienced something or not, right? God was still moving your life as you had faith. That's the beautiful thing. And so the lesson of the week, baptism is a sign, not just a symbol. 
one of the, I was talking with one of the brothers from church here, and we were, we were talking about, what if I never experienced anything in my baptism? That does not negate what the Lord does through your faith, right? Um, there was actually a picture, some, especially if, if you grew up in the Christian church, and you had a pretty good life, and you lived, you didn't really go way off the rails, and you were not really a black sheep of the family, right? If you were maybe just a gray sheep, you may lied here a little bit, you stole your grandma's candy, things like that, you're a little gray sheep. When you're baptized and you go from gray to white, it might not feel that big a deal, right? You're just taking a step of faith, you're taking a step of obedience. But if you're a black sheep, drug addict, sleeping around, having sex, getting drunk all the time, and you're changing your life and you really do feel you've actually given yourself to be a slave to sin, when you're baptized and you go from a black sheep to a white sheep, it feels a lot different. It's a, big, it's, a, it's a pretty big change for you, right? And so we don't, again, that's why it's not essential of clarifying exactly what God does because everyone's experience with your Lord and your Savior is different. Um, but we want to make sure that, or at least get the processing, the idea of how God is moving in our lives as we take that step of faith and be obedient to it. I will invite the welcome, or the worship team up, and uh, we'll close our service with worship, but I will pray um, for us. And again, we're open after, after worship here. We're going to be in the fellowship hall for Connect Group just to ask questions, ask, express concerns. Like, hey, I don't believe that, Chad. How, what about these verses? That's great. Let's look at them together. Again, we only have these 35 minutes or so. Um, there's a lot of other verses we can talk about and work through, but um, we're just on a journey. We're all on a journey with Jesus, and we're excited to be here together. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you bring clarity. We just ask, Father, that you would continue to unite us together in love. We pray you'd continue to reveal your word to us. James 1 promises that if we lack knowledge and we ask for it, you shall give it to us. And so we just want your understanding, God. We want your understanding of how you're moving in our lives and what you say in your word um, so we can live for you and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.